Hello and welcome back to this series where I talk about books. I need, I do, I genuinely do need to brand this. Yeah, um, Doctor Books. Doctor Books. <laughs> My PhD is not in books. <laughs> Thank you for that input. This is Mr. Lewis Brindley. Hello. So, Lewis, you're one of the founding members of the Oxcast. Yes. We are here at Yog Studios. Yes. Uh, and so you do well. What do you, for people who don't know who you are? What do you do on the internet? So I'm a YouTuber and Twitch streamer. I, I I've been going for years now, um, and I appear on various channels. We play very various games. So I, I love I love books and I, I wish I read more. Um, I mean, I think the thing that got me really into reading, and I think this is weirdly similar for a lot of people, is Harry Potter. Okay? Yeah, I enjoyed like books before then, but I think Harry Potter was a, such a good book, and you know it was a good book because it changed my habits, right? It changed my reading habits. I was like, staying up later to read it, or I found I was reading at my desk, or I was, reading in places I didn't read before, mm. it really sucked me into that universe. And I was just about the right age for it when it all came out. I was like 15, 16 when oh, right. the first three were out. Mm. And so I followed that, you know, I was it was excited about the pre-release, you know, it was, yeah, it was a strange yeah. thing to pre-order a book, you know, and I hadn't done anything like it before. So, you know, I, like a lot of people, I grew up being a big, big fan of Harry Potter and um, and, and slowly over time had my joy eroded away from me, okay? <laughs> okay. It felt Everything like was a step down the later in Potter. the series, the books were, that came out, I was a little bit older then because they were kind of delayed and I didn't really associate with them that much more and I'd also read a lot more other stuff in the meantime. I think it kick-started my reading and so I have a big soft spot for it but I ended up reading a lot of things that I thought were better or, or, or have aged better than, than the later Harry Potter books and then obviously the films um, I was never a big fan. And I think it's always a tricky thing to have read a book and then watching the film adaptation. Yeah. Sometimes I think it can bring it to life. I don't think The Lord of the Rings was a very good book when I read that as a teenager. That wasn't something that sparked interest in reading for me. Lord of the Rings, it was a famous thing, it was a fantasy that I should have liked. It should have been a gateway into it, but it wasn't. And I, I read it and I pushed through it. And, but the movies were, were fantastic and they, was something that really got me back into that in a big way and loving the Lord of the Rings universe. So was it just too dense? Was it too kind of Tolkien-esque? It was, know? it was too heavy, it's a heavy read. And I think even now Lord of the Rings is a heavy read. I think when yeah. you look at Harry Potter, it's a very light read, it's very, it's very well read, it's very easy. You're never, your eyes never jar as you roll over it. You can skip bits if you want, like, and, like, like people, some people like to skim and speed read through chapters they can't get on with. Mm. Like sometimes for me, I'm one of these people, as a, I, used, I used to be a writer, I used to be a science journalist, I, I'm someone who reads every single word, and I'm not, you, you can read these, there's these interesting things on the internet, like where you can learn like speed reading and it'll flash up words oh, yeah, really, yeah. really fast, and you realize how few words you need to actually read to get a sentence, hmm. and speed reading is this thing where people really smash through these books, and they can really, like, really get through a whole, load of stuff and and digest the information but i'm someone who's i think i read at a relatively slow pace i read quite and and i don't like to be taken out of that mm. reading is something that has to suck you in and let you be in your imagination and you need somewhere kind of so you don't have to have somewhere quiet but sometimes like that is the best way to get you know, just to lose an hour or two in a world. It's not just words on a page, it's an experience. Yeah. yeah. There's something meditative about it though, like reading, because it's so simple, the act of just plain white, you know, when you open a book, it's like code. You know, mm. if, if you, to the uninitiated, like, you know, it's, you have to, but in a sense like that, the fact that it's so simple, and there aren't pictures, you know, it doesn't, if there were pictures, I think, in, in books as a standard, it would kind of break you out of it. You know, comics are a very different medium to reading in. Hmm. And I don't necessarily do super well with those. Like, I, I feel like I've read a lot of good comics, really, really good ones, but I'm not so much about the art. I'm, as me as a person, I'm more about the words on the page and the art is there to, as a decoration. I think that, yeah. like, like, sometimes, yeah, anyway, Harry Potter, <laughs> I'm taking over the show. Um, I knew this would happen. I just knew. This I, I well, the reason I'm sort of talking about Harry Potter is because I've been reading this fanfic, and I'm a little bit guilty talking about that. I'm a little yeah. bit. I feel a little bit. I don't know, like dirty reading a fanfic, and 
I'm not sure I should be getting as much joy out of it as I am. Oh, um, okay. In a sense, like, in, I guess what, what we have now is we have a very large community of people around Harry Potter, and we've always mm. had like Pottermore and like the websites, and there's a huge amount of fanfic out there. Um, and obviously, when you get something that's a big deal like Star Wars, there's a whole extended universe full of of books, which I, I kind of um, think are in their little ways are a little bit like fanfic, you know? Yeah, they are. I know what you mean. It's, I think it, for Star Wars is an interesting one because that's such a big corporate universe. Because the, the parallel for me is Warhammer 40,000, yeah. which has a huge number of books published, but then they do directly feed into the lore. So they're less fan fiction y. Whereas, with, so again, like Harry Potter, I suppose, it is that standalone. The aspect. other thing I've got, for example, is um, World of Warcraft. You know, I played that for mm. about 10 years, and that was a very, very big part of my life. When I was at university, I was kind of a bit reclusive and ended up playing a lot of uh, games with, with people that I went to uni with, but also met a lot of people online. It was kind of a bit of an escape, but also I really took a lot of joy out of it, and I, therefore I'm very invested in that universe. Mm. And so, reading the sort of books, around that have been, um, they're not good books, but because it's something dear to me, it's improved for me. Yeah, when you say they're not good, is it you think they're not written well? Um, yeah, I don't think they would be like particularly on, they're written okay. Do you know what I mean? They're okay. Yeah, they're competent. I think, I think yeah. they're, it's like, you know, it's like, okay. It's not going to be game breaking. It's not going to be something that you finish at the end and you're like, "Wow, that was great." You're like, "That was that was." It's like potatoes and peas and <laughs> and a, like a cheap hamburger. Do you yeah, know? Yeah, like, I, mean, I know what you mean. It's like edible. Um, you know, and I think a lot of content is like that. You know, it's just kind of it doesn't have to be great, but it just has to be good enough for you. Um, so no, I've been reading this this fanfic called Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. Which right. I have heard about this one. Which is written by this guy, I can't quite remember his name, I think it's like Elizar Yedanowski. He sounds that, like a dark wizard. Is that his real name? Oh, is in like it's, an, it's a pseudonym, it's not? No, I think I mean, it is his real name. Okay. And he is basically a guy who would, when he was a teenager, have been flagged up as r slash I am very smart, right? Like there's a subreddit of people who love to, who are, who are not smart necessarily, but think they are. Yeah. and they lord over other people. It's a dangerous thing to have, right? It's a very specific character type. You're not that, Simon. I, you're I very like to humble. Think and a lot of scientists are very humble or because some of the most expert scientists in their field think they are still kind of, it's not an imposter syndrome necessarily, but, but think they still have interesting things to learn. Yeah, it's, it's the confidence curve, isn't it? With the level of knowledge. And yeah. The more knowledge you get, the more you realize how little you learn, up and, uh, how little you know up until a point. And then when you're a Nobel Prize winning scientist, presumably you start getting a little bit more confident in, you know, your well, You'd hope so. <laughs> yeah. At least the Nobel Prize gives you a big ego boost. Yeah. To the point where you maybe start feeling a bit cocky that you're a... Uh, but that's a dangerous path to walk down. Mm. Um, anyway, um, this guy wrote this, obviously, again, a big Harry Potter fan, but also a, a, a philosopher and sort of someone who's well-read right. um, has obviously taken... Harry Potter and sort of made it almost like a parallel universe where people don't do stupid things. Okay, now I see. there's a it's very easy to forgive stupidity in TV and, and and film and stories and books in general. Like when a character does something stupid and everyone says, "Oh, what a stupid idiot!" Everyone else says, "Well." There wouldn't be a book if he wasn't stupid. Yeah, you know. It's, yeah, and that is such a lazy horrible half-assed excuse because that is not how people act well but no people do act illogically like they're not perfectly logical the entire time no and people do stupid stuff all the time and you're like why did you do that like that was stupid but i think that sometimes it's frustrating um when you've got a character who's who's i don't know like for example with red rising i mean mm. i like red rising um i like the series um, I've read um, up to Iron Gold, so I, I think that's like the fourth one. Right. Um, and I think they're great. So Red Rising, if you don't know, it's about this sort of universe about 200 years in the future where kind of the, like a Roman-esque caste-based system of golds runs the galaxy, runs the, the known, the sort of solar system. And they have this solar empire hmm. uh, where they kind of lord over everyone. And it, in the lower castes are you know, silvers who are kind of like the accountants or whatever. And then you've got like greens who are the engineers or, or blues who are like 
I don't know. It goes down to like the Browns who were the cleaners. I don't know. It's written by a guy who's he's, he he he's quite good, and it's quite it's quite good. I think it's it, again, it's good. Yeah. Uh, it's not great, but it's good. Um, and I found it very difficult to to get on with the main character, who is at the same time a genius, but cannot see like an incredibly obvious juggernaut heading his way. Yeah. Like. You know what I mean? And I suppose that is the infallibility of people when you have to let go sometimes. But sometimes I, it was almost too much to bear. Yeah. It, was, it felt irrational. People would make these decisions that were too irrational. Mm. And you couldn't put yourself in their heads anymore. That's the classic problem with like, horror movies, isn't it? Like yeah. people doing stupid, like Cabin in the Woods poking fun of it, like, you know, we should split up and all these things. But do you watch Community? Yeah, I've watched all of Community. So it's the episode where uh, they all take turns to tell horror stories. And it sounds like Arved's version, where they just stand in the centre of a room, facing opposite directions, listening to the radio, and it's all perfectly rational. And so it's incredibly... It, it, okay, perhaps what I'm trying to ask here, is it incredibly boring? Like, how, where does the conflict come from in the story if people act entirely rationally? Well, that's the thing. If you have very smart people trying to outsmart each other, then it's a, it's a joy to watch. Like, I think when... Okay, so J.K. Rowling's pseudonym is Robert Galbraith. Galbraith. Yeah. And she's written a series of these books called the Cormoran Strike books, right? Mm. They've actually been made into TV shows, which I haven't seen. Mm. Um, but there's, there's, I think there's The Cuckoo's Calling and a couple of other ones. And I think there's a fourth one. She said she was going to write 10 more, oh which is madness. But I think they're pretty good. So they're about, they're kind of a detective story um, about this ex-soldier called Cormoran Strike, Strike who, lost his leg in Afghanistan is now a grumpy private detective boozing his way around London with a hot secretary who is J.K. Rowling. Um, <laughs> right. Basically, she's inserted herself into that full Mary Sue, you know, it's like, and she's like, oh, you know, she wants to be kind of, uh, I get it, like, she is, um, she starts off as kind of a bit like a temp, because that's what J.K. Rowling was, she was a temp, she worked, she knows, she's writing kind of about what she knows. I think that's partly to take a little bit of a diversion, why Harry Potter is so joyous. When you look at certain other places, like for example Japan, a lot of anime, a lot of manga, a lot of stories are set in schools. Schools is this thing that we all go through, we all have yeah. a big association with, you know, and yet in our media it forms a very small part of what we consume. Yeah. Let's talk about like, for example, My Hero Academia is a really, really good anime at the moment. It's like recognised, well, I've recognised as one of the, I rec I, I'd recommend it. I okay. really have enjoyed going through it. And the school as a setting makes it powerful. And I think Hogwarts is the iconic thing about Harry Potter. That's what people will remember. That people remember the, the house system because I, it was, and it was familiar to me. You know, our house, our school had four houses. Yes. It was quite an old building. You know, it had some teachers who were assholes and <laughs> homework and detention and all the stuff that you find familiar. And so it's very easy to um, get into that world. I think it's easier to build the world because there's less baggage. You know, you can already yeah. fill in a lot of the gaps in your mind, but that makes it more rich. I think that, that build up helps too. Like when you have a lot of build up to a story and you, the more you enrich it, the more it pays off. I mean, when you've got a movie, you've only got two hours. And I feel like the Harry Potter movies were weakened because you didn't have the time to build up to those, get to know those characters well enough, like you do in a book. Yeah. Um, in the same way that Game of Thrones, you know, I really like Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Um, <laughs> SEO, please. <laughs> That's going in the tag. I really like Game of Thrones. I read Game of Thrones back in the day when mm. it sort of first, again, like I think I got into uh, into A Feast for Crows. That was the one that I was bought by my friend. And then right. um, I obviously followed them since then, but my interest again was weakened. Like when Game of Thrones, the TV show started coming out, I initially was a little bit, ugh, I've already read this, I've already seen it. But as it, as it was, it was actually done very, very well. The early series of Game of Thrones, yeah. great. But then my interest over time has waned to the point where now I'm like, I'm watching them, but now I'm, not like getting, I'm not getting, exactly. Now we're into fan fiction again. So coming back to your question, I will answer it via <laughs> a bit of a roundabout way. a timer on the screen? Editing Simon. <laughs> How long has it been? <laughs> I, I feel like the, the, the you ca this book does treat Voldemort and Harry as if they aren't just stupid. The thing is Harry Potter comes into the wizarding world but forgets about the, the, the muggle world instantly, yeah. where he spent 11 years there. 
he should know stuff. He should have some contact with that thing. And I know that it's trying to teleport you into a parallel dimension where they have their own concerns and the, the yeah. muggle world is separate. I feel like they do inter interconnect with the muggle world sometimes and it's done in a way that isn't rational. Like Voldemort isn't smart. He doesn't behave cunningly and cleverly. You know, he's not, he, he got, he almost took over the world as this dark wizard, but yet now he acts like an idiot. Um, doing things like an incredibly over elaborate plot and I understand it because JK Rowling is now writing detective novels she wrote the Harry Potter stories like they were detective novels nice. so she put yeah. in all the clues and you solve the mystery oh it turned out it was the rat all along that was the the wizard the evil wizard you know yeah. he was transformed into a rat and she laid all of the the, the traps. She said, okay, this wizards can turn into animals and you have an animal and he's there from the start and she plotted it out and they're good, like as that. They have, oh wow, these revolu revolutionary moments where you're like, okay, that makes sense now. I'm not saying the Harry Potter books are bad, they're not, they're very good. I really like them. And they were the thing that she wrote to train for the Robert Galbraith novels? I, no, I think they're written in, they're written well. You know, she was an English teacher, she understood how to construct a story, what were the parts needed to assemble it, the Lego bricks to make a story. They've been made, it made sense. She wrote them in one go over the course of the year. They're not perfect, but what I'm saying is that I'm not saying that you can improve them either necessarily, like if you rewrote them all, but this is kind of what these, the, the methods of rationality is partly doing in a sense. It's like looking at what would happen if this didn't happen, you know, mm -hmm. would Harry really have been sorted into Gryffindor? Would Hermione have gone into Gryffindor? No, no she should not. have been in, in Ravenclaw. <laughs> yeah. So it kind of opens up the possibility of people being in different houses, like what that would have meant for them, what the houses really meant, and also some really interesting things about Harry Potter that you kind of don't necessarily see on the first time run through. You, when you realise in Harry Potter that why why are Hogwarts allowing Slytherin to still go? You know, when it's basically <laughs> it's designated evil all house. the dark wizards come out of there, it's completely corrupt against mudbloods, you know. Like, why are they still allowing Professor Snape to be such a bully mm. to these kids? You know, like, literally almost child abuse level bullying. Why, why are they allowing that to happen? Like, there's certain things, like an Azkaban as well, like, it's basically a torture chamber where they torture wizards to death. And I understand that some of the wizarding world is still set in the mid Middle Ages, but no one addresses that in the yeah. story, you know? And at the end of Harry Potter, all the bad ones go to Azkaban and they get tortured to death. And it's like, what, what, what <laughs> world are we living in? You know, Hermione is trying to do, you know, the save the house elves, but house elves are magical creatures that were designed to get pleasure from helping out. And you yeah. want them to not help out? You want to? Torture the house elves. It's all a lot of it is like backwards and not really rationally thought through. This is ruining Harry Potter for me retrospectively. I, I don't think that's the point. Okay, <laughs> I don't think the point of reading these things is to ruin Harry no. Potter, but it's to provide an alternative headcanon that enhances that lore. And I've really enjoyed reading this 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 thing. Uh, it's got problems. It's a bit wordy. There's certainly problems with it, and certainly like sometimes you, you step back and you roll your eyes, and you're like, how could an 11 year old boy know this? But yeah. but it does fill in those gaps. Like later on, you realise, okay, why is he so smart? What has happened? Like what are these things? And in some ways, it provides alternative plots to Harry Potter that make more sense. Mm. And so it's kind of like oh yeah, maybe that's why this happened. Or maybe it would have been better if this character was more like this character. So overall, I think, you can look, read it all for free. It's on, yeah, it's on hpmor.com. Um, it, I feel guilty talking about it, but I also wanted to like kind of defend myself. Yeah, this is your platform. But this, this is, is what I've been reading over the last sort of three months, really. I mean, I've been reading other books as yeah, well. Yeah, well, what else have you been reading? Well, the thing is like, sometimes you'll read a book and it'll be, it'll be a struggle to get through. Um, so I talked about this book that I read off Bill Gates's list of like books that you should read, and one of them is called Seven Eves. And it's oh, a, I've heard about this. It's about yeah. a story about basically the moon suddenly just explodes one day, and the impacts that would have on Earth would basically mean doomsday. Yeah. Um, it would it would be the end of life on Earth. Anyway, the point is that Earth has ten years or whatever to get everyone into space, or at least create some sort of space. Based colony, colony. Yeah. and so it's talking about that the first half of the book is that and it's actually very very good um, the second half of the book is the story 5,000 years later so the descendants of that colony yeah right and obviously the point the reason the reason the book's called seven eaves um, not really a spoiler 
is that there are seven Eves. Seven like, women. On only the seven women make it out, effectively. Um, but they've got plenty of sperm. They've got like a whole, you know, sperm is a like library, pretty, yeah. there's like a, quite a library of sperm. I don't know why they didn't have a library of eggs, you know, but. Otherwise there wouldn't be a book for this. Apparently seven's <laughs> enough. Anyway, the point is that it looks at the sort of descendants of, of the, those seven Eves. And, and I actually really struggled to get through that last half of the book. And that okay. kind of was the last sort of, that was a bit of a dint in like what I was able to do. Um, so th those have been your recent reads, then briefly, because this is this video is now called Lewis Brindley Talks About Harry Potter for 20 minutes. <laughs> um, rants. What, <laughs> rants, sorry, we'll, we'll change that. Um, what have been, What do you think are your sort of top five, it doesn't have to be five, but your the books that you think have influenced you the most? What have you taken the most enjoyment out of? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm a firm proponent of trying everything out. Like, um, it might not be for you, but you've got to understand, you've got to, you've got to see, you've got to read everything to see why it might be for someone else. So, you know, I recommend you read, I read Twilight. I didn't like it, it wasn't for me, but I understand it better now. And I feel mm. like it was an interesting study for me to read. Um, I read, uh, I read all sorts of stuff. I read comics, I, I watch anime. You know, I, I don't watch anime a lot, but I watch the things that are considered the good ones, like One Punch Man. Yeah. Um, I haven't really read the manga for it, but I, I wonder if I should in a sense, because in the same way that the movies are not as good as the books, you know, yeah, if you uh, like it, maybe you should manga, go yeah. back and, and, and read it. You do seem to approach content in a way without prejudice, which is quite refreshing. You know, you are not, because, you know, anime has a certain reputation, reading fan fiction has a certain reputation yeah. that, you know, you feel like you're here to defend, but you don't, you seem to have consumed the content irrespective of how the rest of society views it. I'm definitely aware that, you know, someone like um, Pyrian or Sips, who I do the Trifles podcast with, are very much more discerning and concerned about the, the things they read. And they're very much like, this isn't for me. This, I know this isn't going to be for me. Yeah. And so I'm not even going to try it. And I think that's a very naive take on it because I think you can get a lot of joy out of things. I think Harry Potter is another good example that, you know, when I was reading it, I recommended my mum and dad read it and they were initially very hesitant, but then they really did enjoy the books as well. Hmm. Um, and I think just because they're called kids books or, you know, that, that stigma attached to something can be a, a, a kind of a, a, like, it can inhibit your joy. Um, you shouldn't, you shouldn't like, like Star Wars, it's a kid's movie. Yeah. If you like Star Wars, you like a kid's thing. You do. Yeah. They is. are kids' movies. Put that gif of Patrick Willems But I'm in a here. huge, huge fan of Star Wars and always have been, you know. And so, like, 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 you know, so many things. Like, Red Rising, it's a young adult book, you know. It's, but you don't have to have that all the time. Like, if you, you don't have to read adult books. You don't have to read horror. And, like, I read uh, Neonomicon, which is a comic, oh, wow. Alan Moore's um, horrible comic. I was talking about reading, I read it on the plane and it's got like tentacle rape from a Cthulhu monster in like full graphic detail. Yes. And I was like, oh God, I was like reading on the plane. I, 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 you just skipped, through I skipped this it and the horrible. next page was even worse. I was like, oh, because <laughs> I didn't want everyone around me to think I was reading some like porn on there. And it yeah. kind of came out of nowhere. And I, I knew that it was like a, a for mature readers type thing. Um, and I do like things that are like that. Like Game of Thrones, the books are the fairy, definitely yeah. for mature readers. Like there's some horrible stuff that happens. Um, but that doesn't mean that's the only thing you have to read. Just because you're an adult doesn't mean you only read adult books. Just because yeah, it's suitable for kids doesn't mean it's only readable by kids. That seems to be something of a societal movement, like the, the rise of someone like John Green, for example, his books being massively popular, despite the fact that they are really aimed at teenagers. Yeah. Loads, oh, have you read any of those Yeah, books I've yet? got, um, is it Turtles All the Way Down? Yeah, which I I really liked. I really rated. Yeah, it. I think it's great. Yeah, I read that. I really enjoyed it. And I, I mean, I read the Goldfinch as well, which was more of a conventional book, very thick. Mm. Um, and I, I, I slogged my way through it. It's, it's, but it's kind of a book that that turns and changes. It's a more conventional. Book. It's very, very slow. Um, and I will say that I, I was glad it was over. Um, I didn't, I wouldn't recommend people read it, but it's certainly like, is it Donna Tart? I think wrote it. It's like, it's quite a famous, right. I'm, acclaimed I'm it, book, The Goldfinch, yeah, recent years. I also read The Alchemist, which um, is a, a Paolo Coelho or whatever. It's like, um, 
something that the kids are told to read in school often, at least I think in America. Mm. Um, and it's like a philosophical thing about discovering yourself. And it's a bit, I think I f it felt a little bit like a, a, a blunt force. There's no subtlety to it at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the metaphors were a bit heavy handed, but I, I, di I did enjoy it nonetheless. I read, I read Siddhartha by Herman Hesse, mm -hmm. uh, which is again like a, a pretty good book and has sort of messages about being a good person and like just trying to live a, like a, a simple ascetic life of, it's nice to put things in perspective. Mm. Um, I mean, and, and I think your technique of reading basically incredibly widely it's is, like, is providing different perspectives on the same subject. It's right? really nice to just get like a shotgun effect of mm. reading everything from from like pulpy crap. Like you know, John Grishamy crap or mm. or bad. I read or like the the original Sherlock Holmes. I, I read all of those when I was like um, walking. So I had audiobooks and I'd like go for an hour walking and read, listen to a Sherlock Holmes. That was something I did mm. about sort of ten years ago, and I really enjoyed doing that. Um, but also like just books that are highly recommended from like you know. Just, just, just anything like a lot. Of, I've been going back and reading stuff that I was given as assignments in school that I hated, and some I still hate. Yeah. Um, like of mice and men, I still think that. I, I really like that book. And <laughs> I mean, um, everybody in my school hated it. I feel like the only person that's ever read it in English class that's actually enjoyed it. Okay. Well, I didn't like that, and I didn't like a lot of that stuff, like Scarlet Letter. It's just it's very American, but mm. just. Just didn't like it. So your your approach here, the message to take home, I think, from this is read, read, read. But I didn't mind that I didn't reading. like it. Yeah, I think that I want to read more. Mm. And now, do you do you mostly do physical books? Do you do audio books? I do more audio books than physical books, but it's a dangerous game with audio books because you can. It's 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 always the danger. I've had to wrestle hard with putting books down because you know when you buy a book, you want to get your money's worth. You want to get through it. You want to finish it, mm. and you want to you want to see it to the end and I think when you're halfway through something it's easy to say I'm not really enjoying this but I don't want to read it and that is a real horrible place to be mm. if you're not enjoying a book to the point at which you start you have to be very conscious that you're not enjoying it and either you're going to push on or you're going to abandon it and I think don't be scared to abandon stuff if you're like it's pissing you off it's like I'm not interested in reading it this is not sparking joy or whatever it's not making me break my habits to read. Like I, I remember the other book that really was very good for me, the first one was uh, Name of the Wind by Roth uh, Fuzz. Mm. I really enjoyed that when I read it like 10 years ago. And the second one was terrible um, and I couldn't get through it, you know. And so, so I gave up and I wasn't, and I, I actually did the same thing with Malazan Book of the Fallen by Erickson. I read a lot of his stuff and then I got to like Toll the Hounds and I got halfway through and I was just like, I can't deal with this. I'm just not interested mm. and so I gave up on that as well and just didn't come back and wasn't wasn't I think I don't feel bad for not finishing it but I do feel mm. a little bit bad but if I had if I had pushed through you would have <sighs> missed out on the opportunity to read something else yeah I think so we I need to get you off to a recording session that is a lot of words but what I'd like to do is um at the end of all of these uh book kind of uh, videos where I'm interviewing someone I do the, there's 10 questions from I don't know if you've ever seen inside the actor's studio oh yeah yeah so I just sort of get a sense of who is the real Lewis Brindley what is your favorite word flange <laughs> it's like a kind of it's a good because it's like rude but also it's like a mechanical thing like mm. it's like a mechanical part I like machines and cogs of conveyor belts. Hmm. And I feel like you need a flange for somewhere in there to <laughs> make it work. I can imagine like an old, like a workman saying, pass me, pass me the number four flange. And then like the other guy, like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Anyway. Okay, what is your least favorite word? Um, uh, I think it would be, uh, what was it? I, well, what went into my head immediately was cancer. <laughs> um, I really, I don't like, I don't like that word. I don't think anyone does. It's strangely negative. But also, I think that when we did, I did when we did this interview before, we interviewed one of my friends, and his favourite word was cancer, but his least favourite word was also cancer. Ah, interesting. Um, I'll read it as written here. What turns you on, creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, it's got to be anything that you you have to like anything that makes you 
wake up in the morning and jump out of bed, right? You have to try and find those things in your life, right? You have to, you have to want to be excited for the day. Like I wake up and I'm like, I'm excited for this thing today. When you go down and you like, you you do it. You know, it's like, mm. it's. Is there a particular thing though that sparks that in you at the moment? Um, no. <laughs> no, it's anything that is, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of things that, that I get a joy from. Mm. Um, and it changes on a day to day, whether it's the book I'm reading, the series I'm doing, like the thing I'm working on, the, I don't know, anything, the piece of art I made yesterday or whatever, or, you know, what, it's, you have to find, it's different every day. Mm. What's the opposite? What turns you off? Um, I don't know, what turns me off is, is drama, honestly. Like, like people, like, uh, like people who've been upset for some reason and I can't put my finger on how to solve those problems. Like, you know, that's what, that's what keeps me up at night is like, um, or makes my heart pound in my chest is when someone says to me, like, oh, I've had this falling out with this person and I don't know what to do about it. And because I, I hate being, not being able to help. I guess I'm a control freak in that sense where I can't, it's, it's tough to just say, oh, shit, that sounds bad, man. Some days you like think, Fuck it, I'll just pack it all in. I'm, just, I'm not gonna do anything anymore. You know, that can, that can really crush your spirits. Just some negativity from someone. I think overall, like that's the thing we experience a lot of in our business, it's a lot of drama, a lot of trolling. I'm not saying that, that negativity is this thing that really affects me, but I think it affects other people heavily, more heavily than it affects me. I, I have a background of being a troll on the internet, so <laughs> it, I'm a bit more immune to it. I always assume that anyone who's trolling me on the internet is either an idiot or a child, because in my experience, they are one of the two. Mm. Um, but you, you can, it never entirely makes you, you know, yeah, I think some people are very much more sensitive to it than others. Sorry, I'm sorry. Did, uh, oh, a bit of a diversion on that. Right. Let's 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 keep these to short answers so we can get you off. <laughs> yes, boss. Um, what is your favourite curse word? Um, I think it's like shite. <laughs> right. I don't know. It's like kind of is not that rude, especially if you say it in like a Scottish accent, like "Are we shite?" <laughs> Uh, I just, just like it. It's, it's quite cute, you know. What sound or noise do you love? Um, I think I, I think fart sounds. Just, just various like really shit, Foley BBC like on a you know like on a record they've got like you know they've got like background sounds mm. you know like old school fart sounds just like like <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, what sound or noise do you hate? Oh, it's obviously, um, there's certain sounds. I don't like the sound of other people eating, like, or drinking loudly with their mouth open. <laughs> and um, it's the thing that we get on Twitch complaints about a lot because, mm. you know, some streamers like, you know, yeah, drink yeah, sometimes there's no time, you've got to eat. And, but some people do it way more irritatingly than others. And you sit there watching them like, gl, 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 gl. <laughs> And every one of them, you're like, just slowly getting more annoyed. And you, the, the most awkward thing about it is you can't tell them. Mm. You can't say, can you drink less quietly? And they're like, that's just, that's just how like, I what drink. what are you, a control freak? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, you, there's, no, there's no way out of that. You can't let them know. Mm. Um, you just have to put up with it. What uh, profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? Oh man, I'd like to be an explorer. You know, I'd like, I, I wish I could have like in another life been like, put on one of those colonial hats and just gone and like trekked up a mountain or across Antarctica or something, you know, being part of like an exploratory thing. Hmm. Or, what? yeah, or being like a, on a boat, like running a boat, going off and like picking up weird animals and bringing them back. A Gerald Durrell type person. Charles Darwin, yeah, yeah, just like grabbing all the turtles and... What would you not like to attempt? <sighs> Yeah, probably not those things that I just said, actually. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a hard life, wouldn't it? Same answers to both, okay. <laughs> and final question. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Uh, I would like him to say, you're right, heaven doesn't exist. Bye. And then just like nothing. Just like, you know, he's like a gatekeeper to nothing. 
or he's like he maybe he tells people that they were wrong and he's like ha you thought there was heaven unlucky <laughs> kind of thing like that would be good yeah like I just I just want him to like or maybe he tells people I don't know morality changes right I'm sure a bunch of people have gone to or assume heaven ah uh, it's bollocks problem with heaven is right Thank you very much, Lewis, for joining me for this so many, As soon as you start trying to think about it, it just instantly pokes holes in it. Oh, yeah. No, I agree. Yeah, like, you can't think about that concept find- <laughs> without poking holes in it. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, I'm on various things. Yogscast Lewis. Meh. I'll put a, all the titles of your channels have just flown up on the screen now because there's too many to name. Yeah, I, I do a podcast. Um, I, I do... I play Civ. I play Minecraft. And... You know, it's 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 great. I enjoy I, I enjoy my day to day, and um, yeah, we're doing we do a charity thing every Christmas. It's mm. really really good. So yeah, you can check it out. You don't have to do what you want. <laughs> Thank you very much, and there'll be links to all the books that Lewis talked about in the description. Bye.